I'd like to invite you to open your Bible to the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter number 7. The Gospel according to Matthew, chapter number 7. Our text will come from that chapter. It's on page 812 in the Pew Bible, Chair Bible, if you uh, don't have a Bible with you this morning. And I should say to that point, if you don't have a Bible, we would love to give you one. Uh, If you don't own a Bible, uh, please give us the joy of presenting to you a brand new Bible. See one of the pastors at the end of the service. We would delight in the opportunity to do that. Thanks uh, to all of our musicians this morning. Matt's away on vacation. Grateful for all those who stood behind me and choir. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are back in here, but you were just outstanding this morning. You always are, but thank you for blessing us um, with that song. I hope we hear that again in the next few weeks as we approach Easter. I do want to, just before we jump into the heart of this message, give you two um, words of encouragement or maybe announcements other than the uh, important announcements you'll hear at the end of the service. But one concerns the Ukraine offering. This is the last Sunday we're going to be receiving this offering. You can give any time to send relief, but we have been receiving, this will make the third Sunday that this has been open, a special offering for aid to Ukrainians who are fleeing uh, into neighboring countries, particularly Poland And Southern Baptist missionaries are there at that Ukrainian-Poland border. They're trying to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. And we've received a special offering, this again being the third week. And we are at $14,652. So I'm grateful for your giving. Thank you. Yes, that's awesome. But here's here's the even better news, church. Uh, As I told you, that gift is going to be matched dollar for dollar. So uh, we're, we're about, depending on what happens today, we're closing in when this is double to $30,000. So what a great gift to be able to send, um, send on to help in this way. The other area that is just on my heart, and it's heavy on my heart, and I'm, I'm hoping that there's someone listening to me right now that as I share what I'm about to share, you, it will resonate with you. And that concerns a ministry that we used to do called Reformers Unanimous. Uh, it is an addiction care recovery ministry. It is not just for addictions, although it includes alcohol and drug issues. It's certainly beyond that. It's more than that. It is any kind of challenge or struggle that all of us from time to time walk through It's a way to be encouraged and to be helped. And as I talk about this, if that might be on your heart to serve in such a ministry or help, I want to encourage you to let me know. Uh, Some of you could do this. You can't do everything. I know that. Some of you would say, I'd love to. My plate is just too, too full. Maybe others should say, some of these things on my plate, I can put off of my plate. That's not true for all of you. I understand that. But as I shared this about a care ministry, a recovery ministry, it is a need in our community. Uh, If you don't know that, you just need to have your eyes opened. It is a great need. And um, it's on my heart to see us step back, recalibrate, and restart this. And um, it it just dawned on me Friday evening, or I guess confirmed what I've known, that this is going to take more than a few people. So um, maybe you're gifted in caring for children. Maybe you're, you're, you would be willing to help with that or prepare food or you're gifted musically and you could help out uh, in that way or teaching um, as much as anything. Just being here on the night that we land on to meet, to love on people, to encourage them and to be a support. Uh, that's what we need, a prayer, prayer warrior. So please let me know if you're interested. All right, so I want you to use your imagination. Hope your Bibles are open to Matthew chapter 7, uh, page 812 in the chair Bible if you do not have one. Imagine that you go to the eye doctor. It is a routine exam. You're 
expecting to go in and the optometrist or the ophthalmologist is going to put you through the battery of tests. You're going to look and you're going to read and he or she's going to look into your eyes and it's just one of the things on your, your schedule for the day, a routine eye exam, at which you learn from the eye doctor that you're going to need to go beyond me to see a specialist. You're going to need to see an eye surgeon because it looks like what I see in this exam, you're going to need eye surgery. Thankfully, it's not serious if there's such thing as minor eye surgery, but the doctor tells you you've got to get to an eye surgeon. This needs the attention of a specialist. You make the appointment, you show up, you, you walk in, you take your seat anxiously in the waiting room, your name is called, you, you are walked back through the hallway into the exam room, the nurse gets some general information, leaves the room, tells you the doctor uh, is with another patient but will be in in just a few minutes. You're waiting, you're anxious, you've been told you probably need, you will need eye surgery. There's a knock on the door and the door slowly opens and what you see first come into the room is a dog, a guide dog, being held by the surgeon who's wearing dark glasses. You're trying to process what you're observing, a seeing eye dog, a guide dog, an eye surgeon who apparently is herself blind. Your mind is racing, but you're your feet are starting to move faster than your mind because you're, you're headed to the door. As soon as she begins to explain to you how she's going to take the scalpel and she's going to make an incision in your eyeball and begin to do her work. Once she says that, you don't really hear anything else. You are, you're, you're headed for the door. This can't be right. Now, we have all read of some amazing feats by those with sight issues. I've read about a blind person who summoned Mount Everest, of course, with the aid of a guide. I've heard of people with impaired vision who have accomplished some amazing things. I've not yet heard of an eye surgeon who is blind who performs delicate eye surgery. And yet, as we think about that, I think Jesus in this passage is giving us a little insight into what it's like when we try to fix something in someone else's life when our own spiritual vision is impaired. So let's look at the text, the first part of it, Matthew chapter 7, verse number 1. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly how to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. So here's the first point in your listening guide if you're taking notes. The blind eye doctor. Now in the text, you don't read anything about an eye doctor. But there is the imagery of impaired vision. It's in the context of Jesus addressing relationships. Relationships among his apostles, those disciples who had gathered on that mountain. And he's dealing with a tendency that he knew they struggled with and a tendency they would have and a tendency that each one of us struggles with to some degree or another, all the time. None are excluded. That tendency to pass judgment. So Jesus just very forcefully says, 
Judge not. It here in this particular verse means to set yourself over another person and to pronounce their guilt. It's looking at someone and it's acting as if you are in the place of God. It's what James warned about in James 4.12, a verse you may want to jot down. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? It's the hypercritical and hypocritical looking at someone else's life, seeing what is in actuality something relatively minor, a minor failure, a misstep, a sin, if you will, an infraction, and it's pronouncing the final ultimate judgment. You're, you're guilty. I judge you. I see this thing in your life hypocritically and hypocritically because you have something in your life that's far worse than some minor infraction. You've stood over them as the lawgiver and the judge, the ultimate judge, the one who alone can save and destroy. You've put yourself in the place of God. It's, again, the judging, to be clear, that Jesus is explicitly forbidding here is finding fault in someone's life with something that is relatively small. In fact, Jesus said it amounts to a speck that one wants to remove. Now, it's not that the speck does not need to come out. You ever had something in your eye that irritated you? Something that was really bothersome? Maybe it's something really minor or small. It usually is, but you just can't get it out. Some of you know that a few years ago, I had a retina issue, both uh, first a, a torn retina and then a detached retina that did in fact require surgery. But before that, several years ago, cutting grass one evening, I got a fleck, just something in my eye, pushing a lawnmower late in the evening. I wanted to get this completed. I wanted to get this job, this task marked off my to-do list. So I just kept rubbing my eye and blinking and thinking it'll go away. And it just got worse. And I shut the lawnmower down, went in the house, splashed some water in my eye, did everything I could to get this out. But um, whatever the word, dumb luck, I'm like, I'm finishing this yard. I've got to get this completed. So go back, finish the, the mowing the lawn, still in my eye, bothering me. Okay, I've got to do something. So I go to one of these med first or outpatient clinics and a little embarrassed to tell you this part, but I was uh, irritated because of the frustration in my eye, the, uh, what it was causing. I walked in and I wanted to be seen. I didn't want to wait. And the waiting room was empty. There was, oh, this is good. There's not one person here. Now it was about 10 minutes before the place closed. And I walked to the counter and told her who I am, what I'm there for, what I need. Just please help me get this out of my eye. And what's the question you always hear when you call or go to the doctor? What's your date of birth? Like, what does that matter? Why does, why does it matter when, I'm, when I was born? What's your date of birth? Yada, yada, yada. Get all this made. Please go take your seat. And again, this is embarrassing. I, I hate to tell you this, but I'm, I'm like, why do I need to take a seat? Nobody's in here. Why can I not just go be seen? Please take a seat. Take a seat. And I waited five minutes, 10 minutes, and I wish I could say I just confessed my attitude and said, Lord, you're in control. You've got this. I'm just going to wait. But I just said, I'm done. I'm not waiting on this. There is, this is inexcusable that nobody's in here and I can't be seen. I know what you're thinking. Wow, you're, you're really a, a very impatient person. I left. I went to the emergency room. Let me just say, that was a mistake. There is a place for the emergency room, but I walked in. The person who's in line in front of me to go through the same question, when were you born, et cetera, et cetera, turns around to walk to his seat, and he's got a fork stuck in his hand. 
He's holding his hand with a fork in it. And now I've got stomach issues from looking at that. <laughs> Finally, I get in. A few hours later, I leave the emergency room, told that I've got it out of your eye. Go home. It's still in my eye. They didn't get this out of my eye. Next morning, to, to finish this little story, I go to an optometrist, get called in, take my seat within a, a minute from taking my seat, take something and peels my eyelid back. Something else touches my eyeball and brings it out. And it literally is a little shaving of a piece of grass that you could barely see, but it was easily distinguishable on the doctor's Q-tip. It was a something small, but it still needed to come out. So the point here is that if something is small in someone's life, that doesn't mean that it's insignificant, that it doesn't need to be dealt with. Rather, the point that Jesus makes here, or the problem, is that the one who wants to remove that something small that does need to come out is himself or herself blind, but blinded by their own issues. There are issues in her life or his life, my life or your life that we need to deal with. And Jesus indicates in verse 5 that it's like having a log in your eye. It's hyperbole. It's an over-the-top way of saying something. Obviously, we would understand a log in someone's eye would obstruct any thought of seeing. And Jesus is saying that if you're trying to judge people and correct people and fix people, when you're blinded yourself by your own sin, then you have no business doing eye surgery. You're, you're a blind eye doctor. And Jesus gives a very strong word in verse 5. He uses the word usually reserved for scribes and Pharisees. He says you're a hypocrite. You're, you're two-faced. You're, you're coming to someone and saying, this needs to be corrected in your life. This is wrong in your life. This is where you've, you've jumped off of the rails and I'm here to fix you when you've got your own issues that are bigger and you're not even seeing your own need of grace. And so Jesus is saying this is pronouncing guilt over something that is minor, a minor infraction. Like a blind eye doctor with a scalpel, you're unable to help. But let's don't misapply this because everything I'm saying so far, many may be saying, at least in their heart, yeah, that's right, we don't need to judge. I don't want to be judged, and I don't need to judge anybody else. I would say if John 3.16 is the best known verse in the Bible, Matthew 7.1 may be the Bible's least understood verse. I'm not saying it's the most misunderstood, but it's at least among the verses that are least understood. Because... What we tend to say is that, okay, I heard what you said in the sermon, and I can read it right here, judge not that you be not judged. And so that forbids any judgment, any time of anyone, anywhere. And folks, that's where we go off the rails. That's, that's an incorrect interpretation of the verse to say, that judging anyone for anything, for any reason, any time, is always wrong under any circumstance. The New Testament is filled with references not to judge, but it's filled with references that there is a time for proper evaluation and even a time when the individual Christian and the church must make a value judgment, must look at the evidence, must look at the sin, the sin that is clearly evident, the sin that is not repented of, the sin that is hurting your witness and hurting the witness of the church. And I, I could give you some of these verses. I have them in my notes. And if you're interested, again, I'll, I'll give them to you. I'll email my sermon, man, my notes to you if you want to see that. But just suffice it to say, that the verse does not mean you never, ever, under any circumstance, judge. Jesus is forbidding, self-righteous, hypercritical, finding something in someone's life, and you're 
bent on being the lawgiver and the judge to point it out, condemn, when in your own life you have your own issues that need to be brought before God and confessed before Him and before others. And so verse 7, I think, helps us understand that. It's really pointing out the opposite of being hypocritical, and that's being naive. Look at, I'm sorry, verse 6. Look at verse 6. Do not give dogs what is holy. Now, those of you that have a dog in, in our culture, we, we see dogs as animals that we love, that we take care of. They're our pets. We feed them. We groom them. If they're sick, we take them to the vet. But in that culture, dogs were not household pets. They were scavengers. They roamed the streets. They were usually vicious. And they could turn on you, much like we, we would think of, um, of a pack of wolves. Dogs were, were animals that you kept your distance from. They were prowlers. And so you don't give dogs what are, what's holy, and you don't throw your pearls before pigs. The animal that was most noted for its, its being dirty and being unclean, something no good Jew would have any association with. Dogs roamed the streets. Pigs were scavengers viewed as unclean. Pearls is the message of the kingdom, the gospel message. And the actions that people show as dogs or as pigs would do, they're showing they don't actually treasure the gospel. Those, those gospel pearls are not loved. They're not treasured. And so it doesn't mean that we don't go to people in hard places, that we don't go to people and share the gospel. It doesn't mean that we try one time and say, okay, they rejected it. I'm not going to cast my pearls before them. That's not the point. The point I believe Jesus makes is exercise proper evaluation. Don't judge hypercritically, hypocritically. Don't come to quick conclusions you're guilty, I'm the judge, I pronounce you to be guilty. But at the same time, don't be naive. There is a need for discernment. We have to make judgments. The main point, again, of verses 1 through 6 concerns our not judging over minor matters. When there are major issues in our lives we need to give attention to. If, we're due, if we do that, we're like blind eye surgeons. We're trying to get a scalpel in our hand when we can't even see what we're doing. So I just want to ask you, friend, to be honest before the Lord. Don't raise your hand, but is it possible that you're being a blind eye doctor? That you're, you, you're, you're ready to reach for your scalpel. You, you see something and you can, you're uh, ready to jump on it. You're ready to make the correction. You're ready to do surgery. Is there anyone who's coming to mind that you're wrongly judging? How quickly do we say, I know my way is right. My way is the right way. Your way is the wrong way. How quickly can we do that? And when I do that, do you know what it means? It doesn't mean I'm smart. It means I'm arrogant. When I'm quick to draw those conclusions. I'm just going to give you a couple of areas. Beyond that hypercritical, hypocritical judging, other ways that we might, we might fall into judging people. I'll just, just make mention of it. Appearance. Education. What someone has or doesn't have. Occupation. Ethnicity skin color, background, where you've, where you've been in the last couple of years. These are ways that, boy, when Christians judge people based on that, again, outside of, here's this little thing in your life, let me fix it. Those are other areas where we can slip into judging. So bottom line, realize there's a judge. That judge is God. You are not that judge. Don't go around trying to correct minor infractions. Minor struggles, when you've got issues in your own life, don't criticize brothers and sisters in Christ. And parents, 
and grandparents, may I just speak to you directly, specifically about this thing of judging. If you have a tendency toward judging your church, judging the body of Christ, maybe outside of your local church, just you just judge. You, you, your lunch times, are, it, it's not so much the, the roast that you take out of the, the oven. You roast, you cook, you, you fry what you heard and what you experienced at church. You, you find all the nitpicky weaknesses or failures of your church. The, the problems, the, the areas where in the sermon, we'll just say that, the preacher the preacher said this. He didn't say this. He didn't, he didn't do it this way. My connect group leader could have done this so much differently. Can I just, may I just say this to you? If your children grow up every Sunday after church, if your grandchildren grow up around you as grandparents and all they hear from you is the negative, this is what's wrong, this is what's the problem, don't be shocked. If when your kids get old enough, now hear me out, let me say it, don't be shocked if you cannot interest them in going to church. Because they've grown up hearing mama and daddy or granddaddy and grandmother gripe and grumble and complain about everything they can complain about at church. So there, there are other reasons, certainly. You, you, you could say, Pastor Chuck, my, I know I've probably judge some, but that's not, that wasn't a way, of my, a way of life for us, and our kids today have little or no interest in the Lord and church. Listen, I'm not saying this is always and only the reason. You may have loved your church and loved your church and pray for your church and serve in your church, and your kids made, a, made their own decision. It had nothing to do. They, they may have a hundred reasons to point to for why they're not in church, but it's not because you were a judge. So that's not a blanket statement, but it is a word of caution for us. We need to lift up the body of Christ. We need to lift up those brothers and sisters that do it differently from us. We, we need to lift up our local assembly, our local gathering before people. So from the blind eye doctor, Jesus deals with our need for seeing how to pray. And that's the last part of the sermon or the text this morning I want to read. Lord willing, uh, we'll finish this Sermon on the Mount next Sunday. But look at verse 7. From a blind eye doctor to seeing how to pray. Jesus gives some great instructions here on prayer. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. Can you think of any more encouraging words to pray than that? The Lord knows we need help with prayer. The Lord knows we struggle with it. The Lord knows that when we're by ourselves and we're alone, that, that sometimes our prayers feel like they're going nowhere, that our minds can be distracted. He knows we need help. So he gives us some help. And it's not complicated. Ask. Just simply ask. It, it means to, to come with humility to God as the source of all good things. And to simply ask Him. And to seek. To seek is the idea of searching out the will of God. It's one thing to, to say, I need a job. It's another thing to go out and try to find one. It's one thing to say, I wish I knew how to play the piano or the guitar or some other uh, ability. It's another thing to seek, to press into it, to, to seek to learn how to do it, to seek to know the answers. So I ask, I come to a good father, and then I seek, I, I want to know his will. But then there's that idea of knocking, which speaks of persistence. A perseverance even when there's resistance. It's not that God is resistant, but God's not always going to answer on the first prayer I pray. And so there's that idea of knocking, of keep coming to the door, of persevering with it, of pressing on. So this is what our Lord is calling us to. 
And then he gives the assurance that he's going to answer. Look at verse 8. For everyone. Oh, I'm so glad it says everyone in the English Standard Version. Everyone. Whatever version you're using, there's some form of that. There's no limitations here. Everyone who asks, what's going to happen? They're going to receive. Everyone who seeks is going to find. And everyone who knocks that door is eventually going to be opened. If it's the Lord's will, if this is something that you need, if something that's good for you. And that's, I believe, the meaning of verse 9. Which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? Bread and fish were the two main components of the diet of the Jewish person. That was just... I mean, that was like Chick-fil-A and pizza. That's just two things that you're going to have. And so bread and fish. And so if, if, you, if your child asks for that, what father is going to say, well, let me be deceptive. Let me trick him. Let me, let me get this stone that really looks like a loaf of bread and put that down and say, here, son, try that. Or you want something with scales? Well, try this snake. Who's going to do that? Nobody. Nobody would do it. It's what he's, what he's encouraging with. If your son asks for bread, he's not going to give him a stone. If he asks for a fish, he's not going to give a serpent. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? You want a great Bible study? Trace that phrase, how much more? How much more? How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? So the, the urging here is to persevere in prayer. To know that you have a good Father. Jesus circles back to prayer again. He's already done that. We, we heard that from Joshua's sermon uh, two, two weeks ago. So he, he knew that there would be challenges. I, I read... This morning, a tweet of, of a pastor from a pastor in North Carolina. Very simple. I loved it. Salvation is surrender. Sanctification is war. Salvation is, I'm sorry, salvation is surrender. It's just surrendering to Jesus, but sanctification is war. Prayer can be like war because Satan hates prayer. He doesn't want you to pray. So he fights it. So Jesus gives us all this great encouragement to pray. And while we face challenges and we feel like we can't do it, we easily forget to see the power of prayer and that prayer can accomplish so much. I love what George Mueller once wrote. Here it is on the screen. The greater the difficulty to be overcome, the more it will be seen to the glory of God. How much can be done by prayer and faith? You know the George Mueller story, I hope, right? He wanted to be a missionary. He was saved out of a the botch lifestyle. He, he was a rebel against God. God saved him. He wanted to go to the mission field and the door kept closing. But what God kept putting on his heart was orphans, homeless kids in England or in, in the city of London all around him. And he'd had no money, no resources, no place to put them, no, no means to get food, medical care, all that they would need. But the Lord wouldn't let it go. He gave him a vision. Care for these children. And everything that happened over and over and over, every morsel of food, every medical care, every provision of housing, it came about because he prayed. He asked God to send it. So he's quite qualified to speak on prayer. Our last verse, whatever you wish that others will do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. This is a summary the essence of God's will for his people in the Old Testament and now for Jesus' disciples. From this point on, Jesus is going to call his audience to make a decision between, between two ways. You're either for him or you're against him. But for here, the golden rule, we're called to do for others and do good to them because God through Christ has done good for us. So I think all these verses, while they may seem disjointed or disconnected, they, they tie together. 
You're not a judge looking for something minor, hypercritically, hypocritically judging. You're not doing that. You're praying for discernment. You, you need discernment. I need discernment. It's not that we never judge. We're just not trying to judge everybody for everything. But as we ask, as we seek, as we knock, and individually and sometimes collectively, we come to a consensus and a belief that there's an issue of sin that is destroying a person's life and we love them enough that we want to correct, we want to try to call them to repentance and we want to restore them. And so as we do that, we want to treat them delicately. We want to treat them as gently as we possibly can. We want to do unto others as we would want done unto us. And yes, if we are truly Christians and we're drifting and we've, our Christian life has gone off the rails, should we not want someone to come to us? If I'm drifting out into the open sea, do I not want somebody to shout, come back in? And if I ignore it, do I not want somebody to come and come out to me and say, you're, you're in a dangerous place? Of course we do. So a decision really is needed as we look at these verses. Very familiar verses, but they do call for a, a response. Before God, you know that judging may have become a way of life for you. And if that's the case, dear friends, I'm calling you and urging you to repent and to fight against that tendency to judge. And let's just say it. Let's call it like it is. We all do it sometimes. We've all done it, and we all can too quickly do it. And concerning prayer, hear the encouragement Jesus gives us this morning. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. Prayers work, but it's a good work. Let's pray. By the way, can I just insert this? Pray for Easter Sunday. Invite someone to come with you to church on Easter that does not normally go to church. Be a mouthpiece for the Lord to say to someone in your sphere of influence, will you join me at my church on Easter? Let's pray that God will re reach into the hearts of people around us. Now there's one last word I want to say to you, and that comes out of verse 11. And you may be wondering why I didn't say anything about this thing, you who are evil. I talked about the verse, but I never mentioned that part. And here's what it means. You who are evil, you're a good dad, you're a good mom. You'd never give your kids something that's bad for them. God is a good and gracious God. He only gives us those things we need. We don't get all we want, but we get everything we need. He doesn't trick us or deceive us, and he never gives us something to harm us. But Jesus said to his disciples, you who are evil. There is a basic fundamental problem that every human being is born with, and that's called sin. And when sin is the problem, the only remedy is Jesus. And Jesus' remedy for sin is that He died on the cross. He shed His blood. He poured out His life on Calvary's cross to pay the sin debt of evil people just like me and just like you. And we might say, I'm not evil. I may have some weaknesses. No, Jesus says, you're evil and I'm evil. And we have a great need and that need is for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so as our choir was singing, it was finished on the cross. It was on the cross. Jesus took care of the sin problem. And when he was raised from death to life, God authenticated what he did. God said, I accept what my son did. And if you repent and believe on Jesus, he will save you. And Christian friend, Repentance and belief is not a once and done deal. We too need to repent and to continue to believe. And maybe in this matter of judgment, some of us need to do it this morning. Maybe as we look at our prayer lives and how we're treating others, this is the call to repentance and belief. Let's pray together. As we bow our heads, close our eyes, think of the text, friends, and let the Lord examine your heart 
Think of those words a moment ago that our choir so effectively shared. It was finished on the cross. There's nothing to be added, nothing you need to do, but receive the gift Jesus offers. Now, Lord, thank you for your word. I pray, God, that you would work in our hearts. Would you put the light into our lives, God? Would you expose us where we are judging someone? Would you expose our judgment to us, God, and give us grace to repent, to confess the sin and turn from it? God, we all have done it. We all need your grace and forgiveness. We pray for that. And God, we all need help with our prayer lives. We pray, Lord, that you will forgive us for those times we're not asking and seeking and knocking. And I know in this room, God, there are some mighty prayer warriors, and I pray that you will continue growing their prayer life and deepening their walk with you in prayer. And I pray that we would all be encouraged, Lord, to pray more, to pray more passionately, more zealously, more fervently. God, I pray that you will deliver us from treating people in a way we would not want to be treated. So where we need correcting, Lord, would you do it? Where we need forgiveness, Lord, would you grant it? And would you give us the grace, Lord, to walk out of here resolved that by the grace of God, we're going to walk and live differently. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together, church, as we sing our closing hymn.